Japan is full of history, both factual and mythological, and we want to share these stories with you. I will be jumping around the history of Japan to find stories both interesting and fantastical. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co host, Heather. We've both lived in Japan now for over two years and have learned so many interesting tales to tell. We'll also be reading a Japanese song or poem for you in Japanese, and we'll discuss the poet and meaning behind these songs. And with that out the way, Heather, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's go. Today is episode 14, and we were gonna do another two part episode. So, this will be 14a next week. I suppose this week, as we're slightly behind, we'll also have 14b. So, the episode name that we came up with is Hey, Say My Name, 1000 Yen. So, Heather, at least explain to people why, why we picked that name. Because I really like puns and pun titles, so that was my fault. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry for the puns. The first episode of this two part episode, we wanted to talk about the thousand yen note. And basically, we wanted to talk about on this episode, one side of the note, which shows the man by the name of Hideo Noguchi. And then on the next episode, we wanted to flip over the money and talk about the two places that are mentioned on the money, which is Mount Fuji. And a lake close by to the mount. So today we're going to get into the story of Hideo Noguchi. I was going to say, for those people who are not familiar with、uh, Japanese money,、um, each of the bills have a historical figure or a, like an artist or a poet, scientist, just different people throughout Japanese history. So each one does have a person. And if you're not familiar with looking at the notes themselves,、uh, we could probably put a link on the show notes to actually show pictures of the Japanese money. So, I want to talk to you about Hideo Noguchi. Now, he was a Japanese scientist. And to start off with his childhood, so he was born November 9th, 1876. So, by now, we're basically reaching almost modern Japan. The Edo period has ended eight years ago at this point. And for those who know a little bit about this man, he also had another name, which was. Sei Saku Noguchi. Now, Noguchi was born in Fukushima Prefecture, and I've actually visited the prefecture. I went about two years ago now to see how the prefecture was doing after the 2011 tsunami. That was quite interesting. We had a tour guide take us round, and he took us to specific spots. And he, he had recordings of the tsunami at those specific areas, so we actually could see how bad it was in those specific spots, which、oh, was、wow. quite interesting. Yeah.、Um, but anyway, Noguchi, from an early age, he's known to have suffered severe burns to parts of his body, including his left hand, after he fell into a fireplace. So he caused himself quite a lot of damage at an early age, and due to this, he had to undergo surgery. And he actually ended up having surgery twice once in 1884 by a Dr. Yukimoto Saito. And one more time in 1892 when he was 16 years old by a Dr. Kane Watanabe. We know that from one of these operations, that was when Noguchi decided that he wanted to go into the field of medicine and pursue a career as a doctor or something akin to that. And we even have an inscription that he inscribed in the alcove of his home after one of the operations where he carved into the wood a message which said, I shall not return to my native home if I do not achieve my objective. So from an early age, he had decided that this is what he wanted to do and he couldn't return home until he had achieved this goal. I, w- I want to know about the, the man on the money. I, there's so many things about like, you know, Japanese history that I, I really don't know. So the more I learn, the happier I am. So I'm just enjoying. Please continue, kind sir. So we've reached the age of 19 now for Noguchi, and he、um, takes it upon himself to take the National Medical Practitioner's Qualifying Examination. And he passes the exam. So he from this receives his medical license. And one of his first jobs after this at the time was in the Takayama Dental Hospital. And it was during this time that he changed his name from his childhood name of Seisaku to the name that most people know him by now, which is Hideo. 
Hideo Noguchi. Why did he change his name? I actually am not sure why he changed his name. I haven't found anything that tells me if hmm. there was reasons, but like, did he get married? Um, not at this point. He didn't. Okay. Get, he wasn't married at this point. But hmm. I do know that at least historically, a lot of people had childhood names, hmm. and when they reach adulthood, they had different names. Like for instance, when you talked about Basho, and I then did some research about him, his. Hmm. Childhood name wasn't Basho. It was a name that he later took on himself that mm. people then knew him by. So it seems to be that maybe he was holding on to like the an older tradition where you change your name once you're no longer a child, perhaps. Mm. So he's working at the Takayama Dental Hospital, and it was during his time here that he discovered a plague patient in the department. And because of this, because of his discovery, and because of his work, he was shipped off to China. To work there as a health officer, becoming a member of the International Sanitary Board while he was there. Now, eventually, he moves on from China and he moves to America, where he begins to undertake research with snake venom,、Ooh. for which he was recognized for his achievements there. He made some good strides with it, and then after that, he moves to Denmark under a scholarship, where he learns the basics of bacteriology. And bacteriology is one of the main reasons why he's on the Japanese money today. After his stint in Denmark, he moves back again to America and begins a job as an assistant at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. And it was during this time that he made the discovery which got him onto the 1,000 yen note. So he was undertaking research. Actually, do you know what he was undertaking research in? To make his discovery, I do not. I'm eagerly waiting for your knowledge. Okay. At this time, he was doing research into syphilis,、oh. and the year in question is 1911. So he's 35 by this point, and he discovers the agent of syphilis as the cause of progressive paralytical disease.、Mm. So basically, he discovers a bacteria, which is one of the causative agents of syphilis. But he finds this in the brain tissue of patients, which have become partially paralyzed due to meningoencephalitis. Okay, yeah, brain, yeah. brain stuff. So he discovers patients who have this have a specific bacteria in their brain, which relates to syphilis, and therefore he makes the link and the breakthrough.、Hmm. So he's working in science. He's working in a time before there were protective measures installed for patients.、Hmm. There did, there was a bit of a scandal from all of this, which is he was accused of human experimentation、ah. as a follow-on from this. So what happened was that between 1911 and 1912, the Rockefeller Institute, where he was working, they wanted to make and develop a skin test for syphilis,、hmm. which was very similar to the TB skin test that they had then and we still have now. Now, of course, that all sounds really well and good. However, the control group that Noguchi ended up using were either hospital patients who were already sick, or they were orphans.、Mm, okay. So the patients themselves who were in the hospital were quite sickly, suffering from illnesses such as malaria, leprosy, TB, or pneumonia. And the orphans ranged between from as high as eleven years old to as young as two years old. Oh gosh! Right. And of course, these patients who were quite sickly, and all these children, they weren't really informed or told what these injections and these tests they were having were. And there was even a quote that I found from a magazine at the time,、uh, a magazine called Life,、mm. which says the following: If the researcher had said to these patients, "Have I your permission to inject into your system a concoction more or less related to a hideous disease?" the patients might very well have declined. Well, I, I, I don't want to disrupt your story, but、um, well, the, there's a lot of, especially around the turn of the century, toward the, you know, getting toward the mid part of the 1900s, that there was a lot, I know, especially with psychology, probably medicine, yes, definitely medicine as well, but I know from psychology just because of, of my background, there was a lot of tests that did not have informed consent that, I, during this time, it was it was more common to not ask patients. There were a lot of、uh, other psychological tests that were done that people weren't they weren't 
were, were not ethical, flat out. We're just to, to standards of today. They were not ethical. To be honest, it wasn't ethical back then either, but there's guidelines in place now to make them more ethical. So I could see around this time period that it could happen with medical just because I knew it happened with psychological experiments. Yeah, and I tend to agree with you there. Like, like you said, back then there wasn't the laws and these protections put in place. So they could get away with a bit more and do extra things to try and advance medicine. But of course, you still have to consider, especially now, they were human lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad there are things in place now that these kind of experiments don't happen. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. they don't happen. But For sure. you're getting it, informed consent is huge in, in medical and psychological. So the Institute of Noguchi, then they had a defense ready. They had a defense that prepared and basically Noguchi defends what they did by saying that he'd already tested it on himself and proved that this injection could in no way give anyone syphilis. Therefore, it was completely harmless and safe in a way. However, we do know that two years later in 1913, it was discovered that he had untreated syphilis, which he then refused treatment for from the Rockefeller Center. So whether the in what he said about his injections was a lie or whether he got syphilis from a different means, we don't know. Mm. Which and I think is quite interesting if it was a cover up or not. I don't want to say anything bad about him. He's on the he's on the Japanese yen. But I'm just I'm just telling you what I found out. Well he was the only person who took the the injection, right? He was was he the only person that he tested this concoction on? Aside from the patient. Aside from the prior to that. Yes. He purely used it on himself. Okay. Like no no other scientists in the center reported to have been given an injection. So that's all happened now and that's out the way. I want to move on hmm. past that to the other discoveries in his life that he also made. Um, because, you know, we talked about him and his achievements. So we move forward in time and... Noguchi throughout his life had been believing that yellow fever had been caused by a bacteria. However, it was later discovered that it was actually caused by a virus. Now, Noguchi fears for his reputation and for his research, which has now been proved wrong. So, Noguchi fearing for his reputation and fearing for his work because it's been proved wrong at this point, he decides to go to Lagos to try and undertake more research. However, he didn't like it there, so he moved to Accra in the country of Ghana after he was invited there by a Dr. William Alexander Young. But by this point, there seemed to be something wrong, perhaps with Noguchi. Um, he was oftentimes noted to have become like volatile and very secretive, and at this point he would even work through the nights to avoid having to work with fellow researchers during the daytime. And some diaries that were written from this time even note that Noguchi um, was almost bordering on the side of paranoia at this point while he was here. Now there's theories about this, whether it was the result of the untreated syphilis, which could have potentially turned into neurosyphilis to have affected his brain, we can't be too sure, or if it was just other extraneous matters from the stress of his reputation and things. But other diary entries also stressed at this point that Noguchi possibly even thought of himself as immune to yellow fever because he had inoculated himself with a concoction of his own design, which may not have actually been a true vaccine. And so by 1928, he's failed to prove any of his theories that he originally had about yellow fever, and so he is told to return to America. However, he sadly never makes it home, and he had to be removed from the ship May 12th of that month, after, almost ironically, being diagnosed with yellow fever. Nine days later, after being diagnosed with yellow fever, he then sadly died. So, he essentially got both of the diseases he was trying to treat. He end up with syphilis and also yellow fever yeah pretty much okay and i think the last thing to say would be so the doctor that invited him there dr william young we know that he visited him him in the hospital during this point um william's noting that you know noguchi smiled when he visited him and asked him if he wasn't feeling so well himself and obviously william replied that he felt perfectly fine William then died himself seven days later of yellow fever. So whether Noguchi knew, we're not too sure. But we do know that Noguchi at this point had 
been continuously failing to keep this a promise whilst in the lab, which was they had a specially designed house for mosquitoes mm. which were carrying yellow fever, and he kept breaking his promise in that he was supposed to keep them in this house and secure. However, they kept getting out because he kept forgetting to put them back in. So whether that is one of the reasons why the yellow fever spread to other scientists like Dr. William Young, we can't be too sure. However, we do know that he also sadly died seven days later after Noguchi did. But Noguchi's body was returned to America, um, not to Japan, and he was buried the um, June 15th of that year in the Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx near U New York. Ah, so can you actually go visit his gravesite in New York? Yes, ah. you can. So essentially his his accomplishment to be on the sin or thousand yen bill is... So the one that got him onto the bill was his discovery with the syphilis bacteria mm -hmm. as the agent of paralysis. So the syphilis is treatable in the, now it's treatable now but when did the the cure for syphilis get invented or get designed or so the main treatment for syphilis generally he discovered syphilis as an agent of paralysis in a different type of medical condition whereas hmm. syphilis in itself obviously 1928 alexander fleming discovered penicillin hmm. and from 1943 that became the main treatment of syphilis okay so his discovery, though, allowed the doctors to further be able to look at the effects of syphilis, what they did, and to be able to see, oh, this new amazing medicine may be able to help cure them. Mm, I think so. Neither one of us being medical experts. This is our uneducated opinion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know enough about medicine to have a educated definitive opinion. opinion. Ooh, educated opinion. opinion. Thank you. I like definitive opinion. I'll go with that. Okay, so, oh, wow. So, well, the next time I look at the sin in Bill, uh, or a thousand yen Bill, I will know more about the person on it. That's that's pretty amazing. And it's, it's, it's really, the accomplishment was great. Yeah, and looking at it now from, like, this point in history versus, you know, over a hundred years ago. Yeah, I mean, there's so many wonderful advances that were made, but they weren't always made in the best possible way. So it, it, it helped eventually, but it's still, it's kind of difficult to think about, you know, the, like poor two-year-old just being tested with an 11-year-old, you know, the children who don't understand what's really, have really have no idea what's going on. Or even the patients who would have been too sick to say, well, potentially to even said yes or no to this. Yeah, exactly. So thank you for your contributions to modern science. Thank you for those. And it's just looking at it through the lens of modern perspective. It's so it's a little more difficult to think about some of the things that got us to this point now. I know some of them had some of them happened and there's really, you know, they things might not have happened as fast or as quickly if some of the more unethical things had been done. So it, it's yeah, and that gets into a whole other aspect of culture that I I don't think I'm equipped to speak about. Yeah, yeah. I hope you uh, you at least found it interesting. Mm. Well, in age-old tradition by now, my story is over. So what do you have for me today? Well, Thomas, I, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, so okay. you, uh, first before, you went, you went through the typhoon in Chiba recently. So can you tell me what happened um so basically we knew the typhoon was coming i was in tokyo at the time so i was rushing to get home before the rain started all the shops in tokyo were already closed by 7 p.m like tokyo oh. station was empty all oh, wow. the shops had signs up saying we might open tomorrow at 6 p.m because they didn't know how bad the typhoon would be managed to get the bus home managed to get home just before the rain started. And yeah, by about 1 a.m. that next morning, I woke up because the power had gone out and it was quite hot because the AC had gone off by that point. Um, but our building has solar panels, so the communal lights on the stairwells, they were still on until morning when, every, when they also ran out of juice. But basically, about 80% of Chiba lost their power in the typhoon. Two pylons were knocked down, so 
everyone had no power so everyone was scrambling to the convenience stores that morning because all the malls were closed all the big supermarkets were closed they had no power but the convenies they were open they might have, they had no power but they were still open momentarily for people to get food so they were raided pretty quick i think only three gas stations were left open in the whole of the city i'm in so everyone was queuing for hours and hours for gas. And yeah, it took about four days for me to get back power. My school, it took five days. That was over a week ago now, but I do know there's at least one school that still has no power and like small hamlets in the middle of the countryside that still have no power. And I think one school even still doesn't have water by this point. Yeah, so we're still struggling a bit, but Japanese efficiency. They fixed everything pretty quick. I mean, to say 80% of people had no power and they fixed half of it within two days was pretty amazing. Yeah, looking at it from this side, they were a little bit, it was a little slower. Yeah, there were so, so many people without power and I had friends who told me they just got power back last week. So like some of the, the, the major areas had power, but the, a lot of like the countryside or the mountain areas didn't get power and still don't have power. And that, that was a little... A little yeah I watching it not being able to do anything from this side and like I know I talked to you when you were trying to find food was um, when I was, was like, desperately so trying to find somewhere to charge my phone and there was one <laughs> Starbucks open in the whole city yeah Shining that was a stressful day it was a very stressful day yeah I definitely glad that it wasn't as worse as it could have been there wasn't I, I, there weren't so thank god there wasn't so much loss of life unfortunately there were people that that did die unfortunately even more unfortunately is that some of them were during because it got really hot after the typhoon i saw in chiba and some of them died from like heat stroke and not having not having access to water not having power so yeah i mean definitely i was glad that a lot of people got power quickly but i wish it had been I wish it had been faster just watching it from afar. Yeah. Um, but why? Why ask me about the typhoon? Well, I wanted to ask you about the typhoon because it it, it took us a couple of weeks to be able to record together. <laughs> so I was so <laughs> I was I was so sad, I was so worried, and um I prepared a poem for you before and I'm going to read it to you first and then I'll translate it. Okay. Who is the poem by? The poem is from Yosa Busan or Yosano Busan. I have seen it written two ways. He is a Japanese poet and painter born in 1716 and died in 1784. Um, he was born outside Osaka, but moved to Tokyo to study painting and haiku. Now, he wanted to follow in the footsteps of his idol, which is Matsuo Basho. Busan traveled through Honshu, uh, which is the place that had been the inspiration of Basho's uh, travel diary, which is Oku no Hosomichi, or The Narrow Road to the Interior. So he published his notes from the trip in 1744, and that's when he published under the name Busan, because he also changed his name from Taniguchi to Busan. So he was also another one who changed his name, and we have to find out why people change their names. Yes, we do. And also, he is um, known as one of the great haiku masters. So is the poem today a haiku or a different type? This is a haiku. I have a haiku for you. So our haiku is Suma mokomo, tera de monoku. So the translation is, my wife and son eat in the temple because of the typhoon. Ah, uh, okay, I see. You've chose a typhoon poem. The typhoon poem, because also, during this time period, so Thomas, if you had been without power, or if you had not had a place to stay, so let's say your home had been flooded, or something terrible had happened, you were not able to get back into your home, do you know where you would go? Well, these days you would go to like the community centers or the, the designated places of safety. But I'm assuming going on the poem in times of typhoon, people would congregate at the temples for safety. That is correct. So tem temples were common evacuation areas during this time in Japan. But yeah, you're right. Now community centers, also schools can be common evacuation areas, the same as in America too, when we have hurricanes. A lot of times people will evacuate to the schools, they'll set up the cots and have, you know, food and water. So during this time, 
anyone who's listening, if you're in Japan and you don't know where your evacuation areas are, take a look now after this podcast today. Go check and make sure you know where your common evacuation areas are. Typhoons happen here. They weren't expecting this typhoon to be as big as it was,、um, at least based on what my friends had said. You know, going through typhoons before, oh, it'll be fine. And it really wasn't that fine. Also, earthquakes happen, major earthquakes happen, especially in Chiba. I think the next, third, between the next 30 years, there's predicted to be a major earthquake that could happen around the Chiba region. So check your evacuation area. Check your evacuation area. Also, check your emergency supplies. If you don't have those, definitely start gathering those. Also, there are evacuation parks. So close to where I used to live, In Kisarazu, there was an evacuation park about a five minute s walk from where I lived, and they had the big um, giant um, like container bins that they could use to store food and store water and like tents and blue sheets. So, definitely、um, be aware of your evacuation areas, your supplies, evacuation routes in case you do need、um, t h i s Tsunamis do happen as well. That's good advice to give. You're very for sure. <laughs> Now that Now that I've lived through and experienced it, make sure you have th- water, make sure you have spare like batteries and power bank, make sure you have a lot of dry food that you can have because if you lose power and if you lose gas, you can't cook. Make sure you've got gas in your car and just make sure you have a way to contact people so they know that you're safe, but also you can check in on others that are in your area to make sure they're also safe. Awesome. That sounds good to me. So, That's my poem for today. A poem and a PSA all in one. <laughs> But it's good. And also a nice, a nice reminder just to be aware I think, you know, no matter where you are in the world, that natural disasters can happen, other things can happen, and just to be prepared as the song from The Lion King goes. <laughs> <laughs> It may not exactly be quite parallel, but, you know, just close enough. Not really, sorry. <laughs> yeah, close enough. <laughs> Sorry for the silliness. <laughs> so, there we go. There's my poem. Do you have any other questions? No, I liked it. It was an interesting poem, very themed to what I've been I, through. So, thank you for tracking that poem down. I actually did not track that down. I employed the services of a person very close to me who shall remain nameless, but I married him. So, he. Fantastically, I have to give him a huge thanks for helping me find the poem. Well, I guess that's everything from me. Unless you have any, do you have anything else to say? I think, I think I'm, I'm glad I know more about the money and I am, I am looking forward to hearing about. I'm not going to go research this myself. I am ready to hear your explanations and your knowledge about the money. So I'm looking forward to the next installments. All right then. Well, I guess that's everything from me. So until the next episode. Uh, bye guys! Bye bye bye! If you enjoy the Japan archives and have an interest in Japanese history and mythology, please be sure to check out our growing database over at historyofjapan.co.uk. We continue to add more to it every week, and you can find the show notes for every episode up on the website too. It's a large undertaking, so please be patient while we try to make a database which all Japanese history lovers can find useful. You can find us over on Twitter at A History of Japan. And if you're on Instagram, you can find us there at Nexus underscore travels. That's N E X U S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook page, which you can find at Japan Archives. All of our social media is different. Also, if you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes or have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Right now, it's the best place to do so, and it helps us get the word out about this show. Thanks again for listening, guys. Until next time, bye. Mata ne.